<laughs> that was fun. Can we do that again? The interesting thing about studying scriptures and about learning to relate them is that everyone hears something different. I could say the sky is blue and someone would hear the sky and then not really pay attention to the blue. Someone else would notice the sky so they would emphasize the and not notice the sky is blue. Someone else might go all into the sky is, you know, wow, you're right, it is, the sky is. Well, what is it? It's blue. So a lot of times people overemphasize sometimes the very things that they are interested in because they're interested in that area. They create and make something that maybe the person who said it didn't really mean or possibly they exaggerate it for effect and unfortunately that happens too often in Christianity. There comes times where you'll find in different churches or in religion in general where people will overemphasize one part and leave out everything else in the other part. I think all parts are supposed to be together. <coughs> you see, to me, it's like a picture puzzle, you know? You have a puzzle that says 1,100 or 1,100 pieces. So you lay them out on the table, you know, and you kind of start with the little corners, you know? I mean, I don't know if you've ever worked puzzles before, but for me, it's easier to find the edges, you know? You kind of work the edges, you know, and you get kind of the outer frame. You get the framework, you know, basically of what the puzzle is, you know, in our case, it would be Christianity. So when we have one flat side, you know, of all four square, you know, kind of puzzle, unless you're doing a circular one, then, and don't even get into some of the other, you know, possibilities. <laughs> Woo! But if you do have just a normal square puzzle, you know, you have a top and a bottom and two sides, you know, you have a lot of pieces. Well, all those pieces, you're kind of going, man, this is pretty confusing. I mean, if you're I wasn't raised in the church, so to me, looking at all those pieces was a little confusing. I had to learn that they all fit together because at first, I was told, knock off a few pieces, you know. I would have my outer frame, you know, kind of done, you know, I, I got saved, you know, I, I accepted Jesus, you know, I confessed my sins, you know, I understood what the cross was, I knew what Jesus had done, you know, I read my Bible, I prayed, you know, I went to church. You know, I understood the outer framework, you know, of this picture called Christianity. And so I got my frame built, you know, but then it was kind of like a big hole on the inside. You know, there was all kinds of, I couldn't figure out what the picture was. You know, what, what exactly is this thing called Christianity? You know, and man, it looked a little weird to me because, frankly, <coughs> I had that box, you know, and somebody had given me the box, the Bible, you know, and so I had taken the pieces, you know, and dumped them onto the table and kind of sorted them and then gradually I learned to put all the pieces back into the box because I couldn't do it when I had all those, so I just took out the framework, you know. And so I learned the frame and the outer boundaries of what Christianity was, you know. <clears throat> kind of like, you know, there are Catholics, there are Christians. Yes, they are. <laughs> oh, shocking, isn't it? I'm sorry, you're not in charge of who decides. Or like, you know, how there are Pentecostals from the opposite extreme that, yes, they are saved, no matter how carried away some of them may be. There's some boundaries that kind of make us all part of that boxed picture that the Bible says is Christian. So I kind of went, wow, you know, I got this big puzzle, you know, so then I kind of I kind of had to do like everybody else does, start looking at the individual pieces, you know had to look at that one and see what it was a picture of. Well, it was only a part of the picture. Now, I don't know about your pieces of the puzzle, but when I started working in the ministry and doing things in the ministry, all the pieces of the puzzle talked. It was very confusing because, you see, this piece of the puzzle would tell me that it's supposed to be on the north end, and I would be perfectly confident that it was fitting on the south end. But it kept telling me that it fit in the north end, so I would go ahead and put it where it fit, and it would keep talking even though it wanted me to move it. I'd leave it where it fit. 
And so I kept taking pieces of the puzzle out of the box and putting them onto and into the picture where they fit. And as the pieces began to fit together, man, it made a beautiful mosaic. I went, ooh, look at that. This is coming together. And so as I kept adding more pieces, I kept realizing, wow, all the pieces really do fit. Now, I know some of you are thinking, well, what are you trying to do, teach me a universalist theology? <laughs> well, no, <laughs> not really. I'm trying to tell you that there is a picture, and God has the picture in his mind. The Holy Spirit is the person who puts the pieces together. You see, you're not in charge of Christianity, and neither am I. We don't get to determine where the boundaries are. We don't get to decide who is and who isn't a Christian. That's for God to decide. And fortunately, we have pieces of the puzzle, it's true, and we have a box, the Bible, where we can start putting the pieces together. And you know, you, you may not know where you fit, but we can tell whether you fit in the puzzle or not, because once you get it done, it'll make a beautiful picture. And if you find that the picture is built and somebody's left outside, kind of like, you know, maybe the Mormons or somebody that's kind of like, you know, really not Christian, then you kind of know that they're really not Christian because they don't fit in the picture that God intended. Well, I know some people try to make a new puzzle by saying, well, God is everywhere and God accepts everyone. And God can allow anyone to do anything they want to do. Well, I got my box from the Bible, and I'm sorry. My picture came from the box that says Biblios on it, you know, Bible. So I'm kind of stuck, you know. It's kind of like I don't really get a chance to make up my own picture. I don't get a chance to decide who is and who isn't. A Christian. As a matter of fact, I have to accept that the picture I see and the picture I'm building is exactly the way God wants it to be. And I have to allow Him to be in control. Because if I decide to do it my way, I start cutting up those pieces into little, you know, ways that they would fit. Like, you know, it would have an extra little piece here. Well, I try to make it fit where it doesn't fit. I try to make it go where it doesn't go. I try to make it belong in a place where it doesn't belong. That's kind of what happens with the Holy Spirit a lot. People try to make the Holy Spirit into something he's not. They try to make him into a force or into a being. They try to make him into something where, in reality, he has never said that he is that. Now, I have pieces of the puzzle in my picture book that I don't understand. <laughs> they fit. Now, I don't know where they fit, but I know they fit. <laughs> and so that's why we study the Holy Spirit. That's why we are learning about this entity of God, this part of God that's called the Spirit of God, that is a person of the Holy, a person of the Trinity, of the triune aspect of God, of the oneness that God is, of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Spirit, but that we don't really know all that we think we know. Because when I look at a picture, someone tells me that's a person, and I go, I don't see him walking up and knocking on my door. Now, I do sense at certain times of the day he seems to move in a certain way. I do feel as though God is going to speak to me one day through his Spirit, but I don't quite get the handle on this idea that he's a person. He may be a part of God, and I think that the way that God is revealed is in his Son, so that the same way that the Father is revealed by looking at Jesus, I look at Jesus and I see the Spirit of God. Now, some people like to make him a fire, some people like to make him a dove, some people like to make him a wind, some people like to make all these things about him as though he were not a person. Well, now that I can't go with. I can't agree there. That's kind of weird, don't you think? Because we've already talked about how the Holy Spirit speaks. And now we're talking about the Spirit acts as a person and that the Spirit intercedes, which only a person, a self-determinant person, that can think and act and do in a 
operate in a certain way, could do. Second, the Spirit intercedes. Paul writes in Romans 8.26, Likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And in John 15.26, Jesus tells us, And when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. So the Spirit testifies of Jesus. You know, it's interesting in using the book is that we do see certain aspects, <coughs> attributes that of the Spirit of God make us think of him as a person. But we also see things that we know could be more than that too, huh? So don't limit yourself and confine yourself only to what you think you know, but rather take all the pieces from the box as we put them together in assembling this beautiful picture of who the Spirit of God is, what the Spirit of God is, how He operates, how He moves in our lives, and how He does things, so that He may reveal to you exactly who He is, because I can't, neither can you. We can't put down and say, and you know, I'm going to argue with maybe some of my friends you know, that I'm agreeing with, but I also say there's more. They may say at Calvary Chapel and you know, all my other bros in ministry, you know, well, Holy Spirit's a person. You know, Father, Son, Spirit, so because they are Godhead, you know, one same spirit, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I'd say, yeah, but, you know, answer me this. Will the Holy Spirit walk up as a person and say, hi, Michael, I'm the Holy Spirit. No, but the Spirit of God will work through us. So I can go with some things that still agree without being in conflict with Godhead, without being in conflict with Triunity or Trinity. I can be in that doctrine without having to destroy it, but I can incorporate it into a greater understanding, I think, of the Spirit of God as He moves in our lives. And as we see the more that we don't know than we do know. But what we do know we accept and what he's revealed to us we apply to our lives. And that's how he intercedes and testifies. Because he won't speak of himself. Don't get carried away into this presence thing as some people do and how little pieces of the puzzle we want to tell you what they are. Rather let God tell you what he wants you to know. Especially most especially about the Spirit of God as He works in your life.